From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! There is just a sea of people before me uh, from all walks of life. They started filing in early, uh, between 9 and 10 a.m. People started coming. I passed through three army checkpoints where we were first. They're checking all the Egyptian uh, national identity cards, uh, checking for the remnants of state security forces or, or police. They are not allowed in Tahrir. They're the only Egyptians not allowed in Tahrir because everyone else is here. The March of a Million, that's what they're calling it. Democracy Now!'s Sharif abdel Kadus is reporting from the dramatic scene in Tahrir Square. That's Liberation Square in Cairo, Egypt. As we go to broadcast, a military curfew is descending over Egypt. But the crowd is only growing stronger, calling for Mubarak to resign. Will the regime hear the message? We'll get the latest. Then media and dissent. We're basically just uh, getting most of our news from uh, Al Jazeera. And uh, there's also uh, a network on uh, Facebook. I go online, talk to my cousins, write on a wall post, or I tweet my cousins. I have a pretty big family out in Egypt, and we haven't been able to get in contact with them since, uh, you know, the internet and everything has been cut off. The Mubarak regime plunges Egypt into digital darkness. No Facebook, no Twitter, no Internet. They've also cut off Al Jazeera. We'll speak with Tony Berman, the head of Al Jazeera English in North America, and also find out why you can't find Al Jazeera English almost anywhere in the United States. We'll also speak with the Committee to Protect Journalists. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. More than a million protesters are gathering around Tahrir Square in Cairo, calling for the ouster of Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak. Hundreds of thousands of people are also demonstrating in Alexandria and other Egyptian cities. <laughs> We want Mubarak and his agents to leave. We don't want them. All the people here are calling for change. We want change. Today's protests marked the largest since the popular uprising against the Mubarak regime began a week ago. Protest organizers have also called for an indefinite strike to be observed across the country. Demonstrators received a major boost Monday when the Egyptian military announced it would not use force during the protests. Ahead of today's rally, the army arrested a number of government-backed saboteurs and thugs trying to infiltrate the protests. Meanwhile, the Mubarak regime is being accused of orchestrating some of the looting that's occurred in recent days in an attempt to stoke fear of instability. Human Rights Watch has revealed evidence tying undercover police officers loyal to Mubarak to acts of violence and looting. The United Nations human rights chief says she has received unconfirmed reports that up to 300 people may have been killed in Egypt over the past week. On Monday, Mubarak's newly appointed vice president, Omar Suleiman, attempted to reach out to opposition groups. <laughs> The president asked me today to start communications with all opposition groups immediately, to start dialogue about all issues raised regarding reform of the Constitution and legislation, and produce an outcome of suggested amendments and a timeline to implement them. Egyptian opposition groups met earlier today to discuss possible negotiations with Mubarak. Al Jazeera reports the Muslim Brotherhood's refusing to talk with the regime. Mohammed al-Baradai has called on Mubarak to leave the country by Friday. Al-Baradai, the Nobel Prize-winning former head of the U.N. International Atomic Energy Agency, has emerged as a leading voice of the opposition. Many protesters in Egypt have voiced criticism of the United States for its longtime support of the Mubarak regime. On Monday, White House Press Secretary Robert Gibbs refused used to outright call for Mubarak to step down. There must be an orderly transition um, that a whole range of issues, some which I just talked about, have to be addressed, that there has to be uh, meaningful negotiations with a broad cross-section of the Egyptian people, uh, including opposition groups, um, that, that go to answering the very core uh, of the freedoms that people desire. 
The protests in Egypt are continuing to be felt across the Middle East and North Africa. Earlier today, Jordan's King Abdullah dismissed his government and appointed a new prime minister. In Tunisia, protesters gathered outside the Tunisian Interior Ministry Monday to call for the arrest of officials who'd abused and had tortured Tunisians during the reign of dictator Ben Ali, who was ousted last month after a popular uprising. Our first demand is that the Interior Ministry be cleansed, because it oversaw torture against Tunisians. A lot of people in the ministry should be sentenced for killing our people, people like Mukasa, who have killed our people. Our second demand is that political powers in this country are all represented in this government. We are against the marginalization of political powers in this government. In related news, a United Nations team said today 219 people died last month in Tunisia during the protests which toppled the government. In other news, a federal judge has ruled President Obama's sweeping health care legislation is unconstitutional because it requires Americans to buy health insurance. U.S. District Judge Roger Vinson in Florida issued the ruling Monday but did not suspend the legislation. The Obama administration says it intends to appeal the ruling. Judge Vinson was appointed to the bench by President Ray. Reagan. The Haitian government has announced it's ready to issue a diplomatic passport to former President Jean-Bertrand Aristide, opening the way for his return home from almost seven years in exile in South Africa. Aristide was ousted in 2004 in a U.S.-backed coup. In 1990, the former Catholic priest became Haiti's first freely elected president, and he remains very popular. Meanwhile, Haitian election officials are expected to end months of political uncertainty on Wednesday by announcing definitive presidential vote results and revealing who will be on the final runoff ballot next month. On Sunday, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton traveled to Haiti and said President Preval's chosen successor, Jude Celestin, should withdraw from the runoff vote amid evidence of election fraud in his favor in the first round in November. The Center for Constitutional Rights is renewing its call for the Obama administration to stop deportations to Haiti, after at least one Haitian national died of cholera-like symptoms just weeks after he was deported from the United States. The Obama administration resumed deportations to Haiti in January. The Center for Constitutional Rights reports the deported Haitians were exposed to cholera when they were held in police deportation holding cells in Haiti. Sunita Patel is a lawyer with the CCR. At least one person that we know of has died of cholera-like symptoms. It's just a complete tragedy that the government of the United States has done nothing to stop the deportations, despite knowledge that this, um, that, that this death has happened, and despite their awareness that this could potentially happen to people once they're deported to Haiti. In news that could impact the 2012 presidential race, John Huntsman, the United States ambassador to China, has informed the White House he plans to step down at the end of April. A former Republican governor of Utah, Huntsman's widely expected to run for president on the Republican ticket. Iran an American woman to return to the country on February 6 to stand trial for spying along with two other U.S. citizens, Sarah Shord, her fiancé Shane Bauer, and their friend Josh Fatal, were arrested in 2009 while hiking near the Iraq-Iran border. Shord spent 14 months in jail before being released on bail in September. Iran has warned it will seize the $500,000 bail if she does not return. Bauer and Fatal have been held in an Iranian jail for over 18 months. On Monday, several international figures, including actor Sean Penn, MIT professor Noam Chomsky and retired Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, issued an appeal for Iran to release the two men still detained. Weeks after the Tucson shooting that left six people dead and 13 wounded, including Congressmember Gabrielle Giffords, gun advocates in Arizona are promoting a firearms bill that would allow guns on college campuses and inside government buildings, including the state capitol. According to Senate Bill 1201, public places or events could ban firearms only if they post the correct sign, provide firearm lockers, and have armed security and a metal detector. The law would apply to university classrooms, city buses, and community festivals. Meanwhile, in other news from Arizona, 
A team of undercover investigators sent by New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg visited a gun show in Phoenix to demonstrate how easily a weapon similar to the one used in the Tucson shooting could be purchased. With hidden cameras, the investigators first purchased a Glock 17 handgun, then an extended 33-round magazine like the one suspected shooter Jared Laufner used in his attack. Undercover video also revealed how investigators were able to buy guns without a background check. I'm looking for something like this, you know, 9 mil with yeah. stopping power and, uh, you know, something that, that's newest. concealable. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? That's next to this one, that's probably the newest one I got. This one that's never been shot. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's brand new? Yeah. So it's uh, all tied thing, up. You don't like it, you can just you know, sell it later and sign on your name. Like, when you buy a new one, you have to worry about where it's going to end up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're not one of those, you know, dealer guys, right? No, no tax, no form. You have to do transfer. You know, just yeah, see yeah. the Arizona ID. That's it. With me. Yeah. So no background check. No. That's good because I probably couldn't pass it. You know what I mean? Under federal law, the sales were legal because of the so-called gun show loophole, which allows gun sellers to trade weapons without a background check. Such sales constitute 40 percent of all gun sales in the United States. In an update on a story we covered on Monday, Brooklyn College has reversed course and has rehired Christopher Peterson Overton to teach a course this semester on the Middle East. Peterson Overton was let go last week, one day after New York Democratic State Assemblyman Dove Hyken complained about the professor's views on Israel. And in cultural news, the man considered to be the father of hip-hop is facing a medical crisis. Friends of DJ Cool Herc say he is suffering from a very serious illness but lacks health insurance. While living in the Bronx in the mid-70s, DJ Cool Herc developed a style of DJing that became the blueprint of hip-hop. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm